and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Folks, we here at Chilling Tales are nothing if not sex positive. Because at the end of the day, that's why we do what we do. Tonight's featured authors and narrators are entertaining you for a good reason. They're all trying to get laid. It's akin to a flock of birds parading around during courting season. And between you and I, the host always has the brightest plumage. That said, what separates us from the animal kingdom is our ability to use tools. To be human is to fill our bedside tables with nifty sexual accessories. And since our listeners are both human and uncommonly sexy, Adam and Eve is offering you 50% off just about any item on their site. That's thousands, count them, thousands of items to help you bring new adventure into the bedroom. And with their special offer for our listeners, your first item comes half price and shipped discreetly to your door for free. Believe me, you can afford not to visit Adam and Eve. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item right now and at checkout, enter offer code CHILLING. That's CHILLING, C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G, at adamandeve.com. Remember, this is an exclusive offer specific to this podcast, so be sure to use this code CHILLING to get your discount price plus 100% free shipping. adamandeve.com, code name CHILLING. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about suspicious steel mills and technological terrors. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Creepy Face and Scare in a Box are voice talents Justin Reynolds, Otis Jiry, Melissa Medina, Creepy Face, Jeff Sturdivant, Nick Goroff, Kyle Stroud, Eric Peabody, and myself, Steve Taylor. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by Creepy Face and is performed by Creepy Face, Jeff Sturdivant, Nick Goroff, Kyle Stroud, Eric Peabody, and myself, Steve Taylor. In tonight's tale, we meet D, a man with some time served in the Marines and more security guard experience who finds himself guarding something in a steel mill that exceeds all expectations when it comes to your normal day-to-day -day grind. What vile horrors will unfold in this steel mill? 
And will D be able to make it out alive? Tune in to find out, listener. Now, without further ado, I present to you, I was a security guard for a steel mill. It's hard to trust anyone after what happened. But knowing that the public will not be informed about the truth has me worried beyond belief. Maybe because it's all too far-fetched. Hell, I don't know. I suppose I should be careful with what I say. But I now know something that was obviously intended to be kept a secret. I don't exactly know how deep these people have their hands in everything. But after I share this with you here, I'm sure someone will be sent to track me down and erase me from existence. Someone is always watching. However, after everything that happened, I don't really fear that, or even death right now. Because there's something else out there that is much more horrifying than simply taking your last breath. I need to tell anyone I can, anyone that will listen, about everything that happened when I was a security guard for this steel mill. After I'm finished with this, I will submit my knowledge to a news station, but I've decided to share information here that is a bit more descriptive. It should go without saying that some identities will be protected. Security guards usually call fellow guards by last name, but I think I should be careful anyways. Let me tell you a bit about myself. You can just call me D. After being hospitalized from a couple gunshot wounds from active duty, I was honorably discharged with compensation packets. Being hit with the pain and a quick depression, I never wanted to commit to anything other than occasionally attempting to work out and get through the pain. I was gaining extra weight, hated the idea of counseling, and thought about getting a dog. But my pain subsided enough for me to finally say enough was enough. I was losing money and it was time to get a job. So I put in several applications online to become a security guard or anything that welcomed my background in the military. Stick to what you know, right? For years I made my way through the world of being a security guard, with the occasional aches and stiffness, and guarded all sorts of off-limit areas, government facilities, banks, offices, factories, you name it. Some employers welcomed my license to carry a firearm, try not to lean towards jobs like that, but when the money's right, the money's right. So, becoming more comfortable in the field of being both an armed and unarmed security guard, I sort of made a name for myself and would eventually do my own freelance work for various companies in private security. Some people paid top dollar to guard things that even I had no true knowledge of what it could be. Those jobs usually came with signing NDAs. And I won't lie, though. I enjoyed the feeling some of those jobs gave me, especially the ones needing people with the experience I have just to keep their eyes peeled for armed intruders and to fire on sight, like I was in some action movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger would pop out and start a gunfight. On regular security jobs, you are not permitted to take another person's life and use deadly force, but for private security, things can get more serious. This particular job, after a while, became very much like that, but far, far worse than I could ever imagine. I was contacted by a company, obviously I will not be naming, to guard multiple buildings for both day and night shifts. The area itself was barren, with a patch of forest to the south of the facility, and own property lines fenced off and marked with no trespassing signs surrounding the zone for miles. There was a total of six buildings to guard. Buildings A through F, with A being the closest to the parking lot. Railroad tracks were behind two main operating buildings that were labeled C and D. 
Building A was where they assembled parts, and a conveyor belt ran all the way through to Building C to deliver scrap. Buildings A and B were opposite each other, and by them was a trailer for workers, our guard building, and a yard for trucks to load supplies with dumpsters and a shed for maintenance. Opposite that was the parking lot and our main gate, with a guard that seemed to be there 24-7. We can just call him Phil. Buildings E and F were used for housing supplies, and Building B was basically empty, save for some discarded equipment. The building itself was constructed farther away from the other ones. There were four windows in the guard's office, and one that allows you to see the gap between B and A. I didn't really know what the building was used for, but I actually enjoyed guarding this place for the nine months I was there. Until they asked me to sign some documents in the guard's building, then everything spiraled straight into a nightmare. The day started out like any normal day. I don't like being early or late, so I showed up right as my shift was about to start, as always. It was the day shift, and I was greeted by Phil, showed him my ID card, and was cleared to enter. I then pulled into the parking lot, got out, headed for the guard's office. Looking around, I noticed two nondescript vehicles parked on the dirt road where deliveries would be, with traffic cones placed by one of the vans. Must be some inspectors, I thought. Once, I made my way closer to the guard's office and glanced over at Building B. There was a group of men with jumpsuits and respirators gathered around the front of it. They were installing a card reader on the main entrance doors, but the actual door was gone. Walking a bit closer, I then noticed the welding machine. Trailing behind the other men, there was an industrial and very expensive-looking hand truck being pushed and supported by three more of them near the opening. It was carrying a brand new, heavily reinforced door. That was definitely something you don't see every day. Shaking off the weird feeling I got from seeing that, I swiped my keycard and opened the guard's office door, noticing I had guests seemingly waiting for my arrival. The man in charge of all operations, Sam, was with two people in black suits standing near the surveillance station. I rarely see this guy, ever. I then noticed an extra monitor was installed as well, watching those men outside install the new door. One of the suited men held a packet of paper, and the other guard assigned with me, we'll call him Ray, was already sitting down by one of the windows opposite them. What's this all about? I asked Sam. It's all right. Just go ahead, clock in, then sit down, please. Sam told me, trying to sound polite. And I looked over at the two men before stamping my time card and sitting down in a chair. The two men looked at each other, and the one on the left took a step forward. A pleasure to meet you. How are you doing today? He asked in a tone that did not sound friendly in the slightest, monotone and emotionless. He extended his hand in greeting. Fine. I shook the man's hand and he continued. I am Special Agent Franks and this is Callaway. We represent Optimal Solutions in a collaborative operation with the United States government to store supplies and other materials that may be hazardous if mistreated. He set down a stack of papers on the metal desk nearest me. You can read about us in that packet if you'd like. We need to occupy Building B for a period of time since it is not operational here. The area will be disinfected and anything we work on will be contained inside the warehouse. We apologize for any inconvenience. He paused, probably to see my reaction. Okay, I said picking up the sheets of paper and skimming the details about this subcontracting medical research group while listening. I understand this may seem unusual and on short notice for your security guard stationed here. We've already spoken with Sam and he has allowed us access to the building. He paused again and put his hands on his hips. Now, the work we do is not only important, but it is crucial we are in a secure location. 
I would like to explain a few things. Is that all right? He asked the two of us guards, and I glanced over at Ray. Ray shrugged and spoke. I'm already here. Just get on with it. I nodded my head in agreement and looked back to Frank's, handing him the packet of papers. Due to this particular work study, the identities of people involved and the nature of the work is considered highly classified and any information about this cannot be disclosed to the public. I am sure you have already gathered that we are installing a reinforced door over at Building B. We are asking that you include this area in your perimeter checks during daytime. At night, we will be stationing armed men under our direct payroll by those doors. Watching over the camera feed is only required for you then, but you will be given our frequency to speak directly to us on those devices. No one besides us should be allowed access. That door will be used for our personnel only. We are going to be staying within the compound throughout the time we are here. Military rations have been issued and workers' quarters are currently being installed. No one gets in and no one is permitted to leave the premises until we have completed the work or have been given authorization. We have already installed another camera watching that area as well, so it can be easier for you to keep watch while fulfilling your other duties. He pointed out the monitor. Ray spoke up. Damn. I don't suppose we aren't getting paid more for this crap? Keeping quiet and all that? He asked, chuckling. That was one thing I liked about Ray. We would always be on the same tip with money, because I was just about to ask the same thing. He just had the balls to ask first. Your time and service for all of this will cause a substantial increase in your already agreed upon payment arrangements. If you do not wish to participate, you are free to leave, but you will not be able to return to this area once we have occupied it. If you want to return to work after we are finished, you'll have to talk to Sam here. Do you have any more questions? He replied, and I thought about why they chose this location of all places. It was basically in the middle of nowhere, and I had to wonder about that. This was in the beginning of November, and it was going to be snowing soon. Although I wasn't completely shocked. Companies all over the world would occupy facilities for a period of time to store materials operate in or even collaborate on business within this particular field when supply chain demand was low. Maybe there was something Sam couldn't tell us. It seemed to me that this company operated through more unconventional methods, but that was obviously between Sam and them and whatever was going on seems to be federal level shit. Well, what kind of supplies are you talking about? Is it something toxic? I asked. He just remained still, not moving a muscle, and replied, That is classified information. You are not to share anything about our whereabouts to anyone, and if you do, it is punishable by law, as you will read in the non-disclosure agreement. He said, smiling, and did not speak for a moment. Okay. Uh, how long will you be operating here? And are there any other duties included? I inquired. I wanted to ask so much more, but I knew when to stop prying and could use the extra cash. It's not like I could just outright ask them. Why are you guys using a secluded warehouse for top secret work? Without them getting to some level of annoyance with my questions. The other man piped up. As long as it takes for us to finish, your job will be no different from what you're already doing here. You're free to report any abnormalities you may find concerning at any time. We're just spending some time in that warehouse, and yeah, there may be extra tasks required depending on the situation. You do have military experience. Calloway offered with an attitude I didn't particularly like. What did he mean by that? They must have spoken with Sam about me and Ray. Ray never served, but was on the force for some time and was permitted to carry. I looked over at Sam briefly, and he just gave me a blank stare while scratching the back of his head. I gave it a once-over in my head, spending a passing moment to get my thoughts right and bury any red flags I may have noticed. 
This whole meeting happened so suddenly. I never got a call or email, and I didn't exactly get a whole lot of time to think about any of this. More money was always a plus, and I opted to play the grunt I was being paid for by saying, Yes, sir. Then signing the non-disclosure agreement. Ray followed our new orders as well. The next two weeks after this were fairly normal, minus the worker that walked out during a shift. I was checking building C and made my way around the perimeter. This was a first for me, but one of the exit doors nearby flew open, with a worker in full gear frantically muttering something to himself. It's too loud, it's too loud. It's I watched as the man walked towards the parking lot while fumbling with his keys and lunchbox, then disappeared behind a corner. Just then, my radio crackled to life. Patrol 1, this is management. We have a worker going home. No action needed. Out. Stunned. I stood there for a moment, thinking of what could have happened. So, I recklessly advanced in his direction. Wait! I called out and began jogging his way and made it about twenty or so feet behind him. He did not slow down or stop for me. He continued walking quickly, turning another corner and eventually was out of my sight. I don't normally act out of impulse, but the manner in which this man left his shift made me anxious. He looked terrified out of his mind. It was someone I was familiar with, but never got his name. He's been here since I arrived, so he had to have been here for over a year. Still jogging, I saw that he was already approaching his vehicle and getting in, so I slowed down and eventually stopped. Phil was flagged and he got the gate opened for him. It looked like the guy was shouting at Phil in his car to hurry up. I was standing near the edge of where the parking lot meets the property and Phil noticed me. I could see he looked at me frowning, shrugging his shoulders. When I asked one of the supervisors about this later, he marked something down in his work log and looked up at me. I hate to say this, but I think the guy's on drugs or something. Keep an eye on him, yeah? He wasn't threatening or anything, but... Still, Josh has been working here for three years and only had one incident with the machine, but it was pretty moderate. No one acts like that here. I'm gonna have a talk with him, that's for sure. I just let the guy go home to calm down for the rest of the day. I can't deal with any freakouts. We have a business to run. He explained and I agreed. I told him I would keep a close eye on him and got back to my duties. About another two weeks passed, and Ray told me something that had me more than a little worried. Ray and I have the opposite schedule, so when I'm about to clock in, he's about to clock out and we pass by each other in the office. D, you got a minute? He asked while I was about to clock in. He had a troubled expression on his face. Yeah, everything all right? I asked, glancing over at the monitors. He also looked at the monitors, showing these people hauling in huge computers and, for some reason, large loudspeakers through the warehouse shutter door in Building B, and then looked back to me. I don't know, dude. I was doing a sweep by Sam's office and overheard him on the phone with someone. He put his hands up in a defensive gesture. You know me. I don't screw around and I wasn't trying to eavesdrop. I just happened to be near his office with the janitor mopping when we both heard him yelling it there. He was fucking loud, dude. The door was shut, but it sounded like something bad was going on. I heard him shouting shit like, How come I was never told about this? We already had a deal. And then we heard something break in there. We looked at each other and went our separate ways after that. He finished by wiping some sweat from his forehead. What the hell could all of that be about? 
he asked quietly. I just shrugged, glancing at the monitor showing the new door with two guards armed to the teeth, and wondered, what could be going on in there that we don't know about? Looking back, I should have just found a new gig right then and there. That same worker was cleared again for going home early, and I would sometimes hear strange whirring noises when I would go by buildings A, B, and C. Not anything from the work here, but more like tinnitus. A worker on his break ended up giving me a pair of extra earplugs. They barely worked. I figured that it was some kind of machinery they had in there that caused the ringing giving off some kind of emission frequency or something similar. I did see them haul in those huge machines and various computers throughout this process too. Maybe something with the speakers. This only piqued my curiosity even more. Just what the hell are they doing in there? Having a fucking concert? However, before I could even begin to think about bringing my concerns up to Sam, there was another duty added to my checklist right around then. One of the mill's supervisors called me when I was at home to inform me that there will be a construction crew digging below Building B, apparently to fix some issues with a piping system underneath the building that was causing some kind of leak. We were instructed to watch over that area as well once the leak was taken care of. Is it... Maybe have something to do with what's causing the buzzing in everyone's ears? I said and heard him chuckle over the phone. It was probably a stupid question, but I asked anyway. I don't know. We had to shut down operations today and tomorrow, so you guys got a day off while they fumigate whatever this is and clear it. We haven't been going down there in years, so it doesn't really come as a surprise since they got an operation going on. Only natural to find some old pipes that may have burst. Maybe it was an accident. They better be more careful with whatever the hell they're doing, but if they clear it, I don't really see the problem. As long as no one gets killed, I guess. He told me, chuckling again. I'm confused, I only said. Yeah, you and me both, buddy. I'll talk to you later. The first day I had to work with the extra duty included started off with me spilling coffee all over my work pants, causing me to almost be late for once. The construction crews were to be on site and would remain underneath the building for the next month or so. Sam seemed to be pretty upset about this, and it seemed to be confirmed when Ray spoke about the phone call he overheard. There was a huge hole they dug just to the east side of the building, and for up to 12 hours a day we would see the workers doing their thing. Throughout all of it, I couldn't really keep tabs on everything they were doing exactly. As time went on, we were given tasks like helping with maintenance or patrolling the outer edge of the property for a time, as if someone would be there. We were to report any suspicious persons and keep our pistols on us. Plus, that ringing would sometimes bother me, and I was starting to get really anxious ever since. If I was sitting by the cameras, I would catch myself fidgeting my leg up and down so fast it was like my nephew's video game controllers vibrating. I would have to grab my leg and force myself to calm down. Not only was I stressed about these new patrols, but it was something else. Like as if an uncontrollable urge to either bite my nails or scratch at an area would persist. After a week passed, we got another hire to come in and patrol with me and Ray on the night shifts only because we needed to do active rounds outside the entire perimeter now. He was a shorter middle-aged guy, really quiet but did his job well and his name was Jeff. I never got any other information about him. But this is around the time where things started to get, for lack of a better term, scary. It was mid-December, and the construction crews finally finished up their work. At around one in the morning, when Jeff and I were monitoring the camera feed, I was shaking my leg so fast it caused a slight tickling noise to occur as the wind outside howled. No snow was on the forecast 
just a bitter chill in the air mixed with the darkness of night. Obviously, when the night shift rolls around, there's no workers present in the mill, and the two armed guards are stationed in front of the new door, decked out in urban BDUs and winter gear. It was here when looking at the monitors displaying the feeds that I spotted movement near one of the windows located on the second level of Building B. It was through a feed that had to be panned over to get a better look. At first I could only recognize the outline of a shape, but it almost looked like a door opening. Clearly, someone wearing light-colored clothes appeared past the open door, crouching down. It was already pitch black outside, and the resolution from the camera wasn't all that great. But we could still see them with the dim light fixtures on the corners of the building. Zoom in, right there. I told Jeff who was already on it and zoomed in to where I pointed. It was a person, and I noticed they had something that looked like a phone in their hand. I had no knowledge of how to even get up there from inside. They must have found a ladder or emergency stairwell for roof access. Sure enough, I began to see the person crawling on a ledge and eventually made their way to their feet. I remembered them saying no one was supposed to leave, let alone be on roof access at a time like this. Was the person taking a smoke break? It was here when I noticed the person was wearing a lab coat. I sighed. Maybe they were a scientist, just up there having a smoke. Jeff looked up at me from the chair, and I kept looking at the feed. He wasn't pulling out any smokes. I felt a chill then, and decided that something wasn't right. After I quickly searched through binders and folders that might contain the map of the interior, I found it, and confirmed there was indeed a roof access staircase inside Building B. I looked up at the feet again, still baffled noticing they began climbing onto the roof. Just then I remembered what that rude agent, Calloway, said to me. You're free to report any abnormalities you may find concerning at any given time. I grabbed my radio and changed the channel to their frequency. Hey, uh, I think you've got a situation. Is there someone cleared to be on top of Building B? Over. I spoke into the radio, and I walked towards the window to look out at Building B. The radio crackled to life, and a commanding voice replied, Negative. Our personnel will investigate. Out. I looked back to Jeff, and decided on going out there to see if I can assist in any way. They didn't tell me not to just now. I made my way to the door. Something's obviously wrong. Just monitor everything here, and if things go south, you know what to do. I said, and Jeff gave me a stern look. He nodded, and I got the door open. I jogged to Building B and didn't stop until I got to the entrance of the building. The armed guards had their rifles aimed up at the top of the building, and that's when I saw him. The person on the roof was holding up some kind of device. It's too late. I already sent it to them. They're, they're on their way. The man shouted down at us and began laughing like he was on the verge of a mental breakdown. The armed guards had flashlight attachments and were keeping their aim on his torso. I was about 10 feet away from the commandos and one of them noticed me. Back to your building, now. He shouted, and I jumped at the sudden, commanding voice. Just then, there was that ringing in my ears again. I was so confused, and felt a ball form in my chest and stomach. Couldn't quite gauge what the hell was happening just then. That ringing persisted. It was tolerable, but sounded like there were speakers all around me, blasting this dog whistle kind of noise. I shook my head and got back to my senses, and the ringing was to a minimum now. 
The man on the roof looked to be a scientist or a researcher that must have been helping out with whatever they're doing here. I couldn't see his body entirely, but now, the man was holding his ears with the device still in his hand. You made this mess. The man kept shouting this over and over until I heard the gunshot. Another operative must have gotten up there. My heart sank when the spray of crimson misted in the air as the hole burst through the man's forehead. His arms went to his sides, and he slumped forward, falling over the ledge down the two stories into a crumpled heap on the ground in front of the soldiers. The device the man was holding lay broken in pieces on the concrete next to the blood that began pooling around his body. My eyes went wide with fear. Hostile neutralized. Cleanup unit. Come to the entrance. One of the men reported it on their radio. I should have left. I should have said to hell with the money and gone home. But now, I was right in the stink of this crap. I just witnessed not only something that wasn't meant for civilians to see, but a murder. Alarm bells began going off despite the ringing that still persisted. Before I knew it, the soldier closest to me aimed his rifle at me and paced forward. Whoa, whoa wh what the hell? I was blinded by the flashlight and raised my hands up. Stay where you are. He shouted and I kept my hands up with the gun dangling from my finger. Easy, I I'm not a threat. I tried pleading with this guy and did my best to keep my gaze fixed on the gas mask the operative was wearing. It was here when a constant flood of thoughts invaded my mind. Who was that scientist talking about? Who is on their way? Could the armed men hear the ringing too? Was their gear suppressing them from hearing it? Was I being exposed to radiation? Are these guys even military? Drop your weapon slowly. He barked and I cautiously put my pistol on the cold pavement. If I was going to survive, I had to play along with their demands. I was rushed back to the guards building and was told to stay put until they finished handling the situation. A soldier remained inside there with us until our shift ended. However, we did not get to go home and nobody else came in to work that day. I should have known better than to sit back and allow this to happen. But it was already too late. My gun was left outside and undoubtedly taken by them. The jig was up, and Jeff and I were suddenly taken hostage inside the guard's office. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Human ingenuity really is something to celebrate, folks. While the entire animal kingdom continues to climb on top of each other with a mere sense of duty, we've learned uniquely to have fun with it. With accessories, thousands of them, toys, lingerie, lubricants, her favorites, most wanted, and hot picks, anything and everything you can imagine, and things you wish you'd imagined sooner. And the place you're going to find them all is at adamandeve.com. Adam and Eve has been making sex better since 1970. They believe sexual pleasure is a healthy and important part of life that should be understood and celebrated. We agree. And we think you'll want to celebrate with some party favors. I suggest you peruse their most popular sex toys page and see what tickles your fancy. I assure you, your fancy will be tickled. I defy you to leave empty-handed. Best of all, they have an exciting offer for listeners of this very podcast. 50% off just about any item in their store, plus free shipping 
No matter how little or how much you order, it'll be packaged discreetly and shipped to your door for free. AdamandEve.com is full of so many wild ideas, I know you'll find something that sparks your interests. And at 50% off, saving money will never feel so good. So what are you waiting for? Head to AdamandEve.com and select any one item and at checkout, enter offer code CHILLING. That's CHILLING, C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G, at AdamandEve.com. Remember, this exclusive offer is specific to this podcast, so be sure to use this code CHILLING to get your discount plus 100% free shipping. Code CHILLING. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. It was at this point where the entire facility had been taken over by this group. They had helicopters buzzing in to deploy more of these commandos under their order within 20 minutes. I know the sounds of a deployment pretty well. They had to have had commandos stationed all over the building by now, inside and out. I ventured that even snipers and men with RPGs being positioned in elevated places, they were preparing for a battle. This is what happened. Three days passed after the man on the roof was killed, and it was Christmas Eve when the entire facility was taken over. We were in zip ties and placed in the locker room. Commandos would periodically watch over us. We were kept hydrated and fed sometimes, and Jeff was actually quiet throughout this whole process. I did my best to tell him that help would be here soon, and to try and relax, although it didn't really seem to faze him. I was probably a little more frightened than he was. We were basically POWs. One guy was really rude to us for no good reason, telling us that we were going to die here and trying to frighten us. We were already confused and helpless. They weren't going to just announce it, but there was no doubt we were fooled by some militia or terrorist group. However, I noticed a quick lack of morale with a couple of the soldiers. They knew they were in for it, and the actual military would probably be here any minute. If it wasn't for that guy, you sc- <clears throat> One of them stopped himself and cleared his throat while the other commando remained quiet. Christmas rolled around. There was heavy snowfall, and their command stated that a winter storm was approaching. This gave them the thought that any attack by armed forces would be put off for the time being. But they were wrong. That same soldier who would give us shit remained inside the office with another operative for a period of time until they were ordered to report back immediately. This is Theta Command. All units report to your designated battle zone. Weapons free. Fuck. I heard the one guy shout, and looked over to us. If you know what's good for you, I'd hide somewhere. The other guy scrambled out without a word. Man, screw you guys. I should just kill you both right now. But he didn't. He stood there and stared at us with his hands trembling. He screamed out, and took off to fulfill his orders. Jeff and I were petrified in stone. They only used zip ties, so once he left, we easily escaped. I remembered thinking about just running, but I valued my life and decided on staying inside the building. We got ourselves free and stood for a moment. I, uh... I don't know what the hell's going on. Let's barricade ourselves in, uh... We don't stand a chance out there. What if if something happens and we have to call for help? 
Jeff, for once, said to me in a surprisingly low tone, and we both frantically began bombarding the door using the metal desk, the fridge, and filing cabinets. The two of us were strong enough to get a good blockade up. There was no time to even think. We kept finding more items to put against the door until we definitely had enough weight to hold. At least for a while. After we were satisfied, we just both looked at each other panting, and then over to the monitors. What the hell, right? I remember saying, and we then scrambled over to watch the feed. What unfolded will forever be something that replays inside my head worse than any kind of flashback from my time serving. It was an absolute massacre. First, from inside the building and to the right of us, we heard the sounds of armed forces approaching. A loud wham then boomed from within the facility, and we saw the damage on the monitor. It was definitely an airstrike on Building B. A cacophony of gunfire then erupted all around us, and we saw on the feed as the battle ensued. I could see men falling to their deaths, small explosions, scientists scrambling out of the facility and getting gunned down. Helicopter turret guns ripped a handful of the operatives in half. Instead of hearing that ringing, or even jingle bells, Christmas carols on this holiday season, it was replaced with the sounds of total chaos and bloodshed. Holy shit, I said crouching down by one of the monitors, telling Jeff we need to either get down or get in a locker. One of the handbooks stated that in case of an emergency or terrorist attack, an option would be to lock the door and call for help, then find a locker. The lockers were bulletproof and big enough for someone to hide inside of it until help arrived. Bullets were already ricocheting off the building. We had to find some cover immediately. The help was already here, and the locker room was a small enough space in the building. I yelled for Jeff to get inside one of the lockers. If we stay put, we'll get shot through a window. A louder explosion occurred, shaking the entire building, and we stopped to look out of the window it came from. We were stunned to see that they managed to successfully target an oncoming military chopper and take it down. It spun out of control and landed in the parking lot. The flames destroyed my vehicle. A single window shattered then. We got moving, ducking and holding our heads. Having no other choice, we opened the lockers closest to us and squeezed in. I got down as low as possible. The suffocating dread was persistently clocking down more minutes of my life, no doubt. The gunfire and explosions outside were enough to drive anyone mad. But being trapped in a metal coffin on top of it was not on my bucket list. Needless to say, we were trapped regardless and just needed to wait this out. After some time, the gunfire died down and we would only occasionally hear a pop ring out every so often, and some shouting. The feed was still playing, and I had a thought. There is a record option, and I decided to get out of the locker and press the switch for it. I took a deep, long, and exaggerated breath, then slowly got out of the locker. Jeff soon followed. Let's, let's check the camera feed. I want to record this. I told him, and he nodded. Looking around, there didn't seem to be any damage. But there was a window shattered, and we found a couple of stun batons to clutch onto in an attempt to feel like we could defend ourselves against any of the operatives trying to get in and kill us. We then walked over to the monitors and found the chairs to sit down. I clicked the record option on. I'd say about ten minutes passed. I don't know how long the fighting went on for. I hadn't even thought to check the time. The odds 
for whatever reason, seemed to be evenly matched. This was a brutal battle. Getting a closer look at things as the feed was recording, we noticed just how many commandos they really had. How the hell they managed to station hundreds of armed men in that facility, I have no true knowledge of. I don't even know what to say. I remember saying out loud instead of just thinking it. A short moment passed, and as if on cue, something else was happening in one of the camera feeds that displayed an area behind building B and A. It was at this moment that a raw and all-encompassing new fear now took hold. There is really no other explanation for what I am about to tell you. They obviously should have sent a larger strike team here to fight. Because on one of the camera feeds displayed a person clutching a soldier by the throat. The one arm clutching the soldier's throat was raised high. With the other, he was doing something to the soldier's abdomen, but we really couldn't see. The man was at least seven or eight feet tall, maybe more, and was lifting the soldier up with little effort while completely fucking bare from the waist up. He looked to be wearing some kind of hospital garb, only covered in blood and grime. With ease, this beast of a man tossed the soldier aside like he was an empty bottle. We could clearly see the muscle definition ripple and turn red, despite the quality of the feed. He just stood there breathing into the air like a mad dog, head violently twitching. This guy was an animal. It was 17 degrees Fahrenheit out there. This was unnatural. How in the fuck is that possible? Just then, the brute snapped his head to the left, as if in response to me speaking. I almost let myself go right there, looking over at Jeff briefly as he looked back with shocked expressions on our faces. When we looked back to the feed and before we even knew it, the man was no longer there. God, please help us. Jeff whispered and I noticed him clearly shivering. I felt a horrible chill too, and thought about getting in the locker again. I raised my arm and pointed to them, and he nodded to me. We quickly got inside the lockers again, and I kept the stunned baton in my grasp. Seconds passed, more time passed. Suddenly there was a burst of loud banging on the door, and I mean loud. More glass broke, and I closed my eyes and felt the ground shake. There was this horrible squelching noise, as if something long and wet were writhing and reaching for something inside the office. It was making contact with things inside there. I was keeping my eyes tightly shut, and after a few seconds, I was brave enough to try and get a peek out of the vent. There were these red shapes appearing outside the small cracks. I couldn't quite see it all, but the lights went out, most likely from that thing breaking all the bulbs and probably the monitors. From out there, I began to hear this raspy breathing through the wreckage as if coming from a ravenous maw. This was it. I was going to die here. But in an instant, everything just stopped. I tried my best to cover my mouth and breathe through the little air pockets in my gloves because I was basically hyperventilating. I'm honestly surprised my heart hadn't burst then. I almost wished it had, looking back. A short moment passed, and we remained still inside the lockers. 
My breathing calmed, and I was able to quietly catch my breath. Thank God for the sounds of the storm out there muffling my quiet breaths. Jeff must have been doing something similar. As the seconds rolled on, I listened closely for any sounds, but only the storm persisted. Once I had the thought to close my eyes again and take another quiet breath. I heard the most terrifying noise come from out there, like several nails on a chalkboard. Only it was the yell of a man crying, perversely mixed with a dying animal screeching in pain. Something like that ringing came back, and I lost consciousness from fright. I don't know how much time passed, but I woke to the sound of Jeff opening his locker. Opening my eyes, he appeared before me and helped me out of the locker. You okay? He offered. I said yes, and he spoke again. I think whatever that, that thing is, it's, it's gone. I looked around. The entire office was trashed. Monitors were broken, and there were these darkened marks all across the ceiling and walls. Noticing the broken window, I saw the blood trail on the snow that led to the forest from the facility out there. That freak of nature showed no signs of being harmed by the weather and escaped this place. That thought alone terrifies me. I looked back to the monitors and noticed two of them still weakly displaying the feed. Both the bodies of the soldiers and commandos lay fallen, and I could see some of their weapons still intact. Jeff, I know this sounds crazy, but I have to get in that building and find out what's going on. I said to him. I understand, I, I think. He replied and put his head down. As a former infantryman stationed in Iraq, I feel like it's my duty to go out there and figure something out. Anything. I stared at him, feeling that old sense of duty return to me. And he raised his baton. Do you need... Backup? He asked, smiling weakly. I smiled back, but I honestly did not want this young man to risk his life in case there was something else out there. Then again, someone to watch my six wouldn't hurt at all. I appreciate you. Let's go. Just be careful. When we get out there, snag one of their guns and let's try and look for a radio one of their soldiers had. We might have a chance of calling out for their backup squad. I told him. We devised a quick plan to get inside Building B and see if there was a communication center like their headquarters still intact. You ready? He took a huge breath and nodded. Alright, let's get out through that window. I'll go first. I said and we went ahead with our plan to brave the storm and head for Building B. There may be other survivors in there who could still be armed and willing to kill us. I told this to Jeff and he said he was ready for anything after what we went through. I had the feeling we both knew this was a risky idea, but we were now in this together no matter what else could be in store for us. If no one else was coming, we had to do something, and we had to do it now. There was a window big enough for the both of us that we could easily fit through. The jump wouldn't be but ten feet, so we made it out into the cold. It was still dark, but the sun was about to rise so we had a dim orange glow faintly aiding our sight. We both found rifles and searched for rounds and magazines. Everything was quiet now, save for the howling wind that attacked our senses, and we made our way to the entrance of Building B. The snow was pelting us in the face, and we were covered in it by the time we got inside. The opening on the large metal door had caved in from an explosion, and we slipped inside avoiding the small fires that blazed menacingly in the wind. Once inside, we found out quickly just how awful this atrocity was. 
not only were people shot and left for dead, but there were also bodies torn to shreds and discarded. That thing must have had its way with them, because blood caked the walls and bodies lay in a gory mess. Bullet holes and charred marks from more explosions littered the walls and any surface. We both just looked at each other in shock. Let's go. I said quietly we proceeded forward, because I noticed an opening with some lights that flickered around a corner. We cautiously made our way there, and got to a point where it looked like we finally hit an area with the new construction. The addition was dug out deep below and made into this makeshift science lab. Wires and bulbs that were connected hung up haphazardly to keep the light illuminating the entire area. I could see those large speakers embedded into the rocky walls. Sparks flew from multiple instruments and machines that buzzed or malfunctioned, but were neatly stacked in certain areas. There was a large operating table with bolted down reinforced shackles that lay broken to the side of it. More blood and glass were littered around this area. I even picked up a few documents on the ground, but most were stepped on or covered in filth and blood to even be legible. Scientists and soldiers, both our military and their commandos, were all dead. I was speechless. There were no words to even be said at all. We just walked into something straight out of a horror film. You want to have a look around those desks? You check that upper level over there and see if you can find a soldier with a radio. I told Jeff and he agreed, aiming the rifle around and walking away. I made my way towards the set of desks that had computers still booted up. Some were destroyed and I tried messing around with one of them and opening anything that could tell me what they were doing here. I couldn't find anything discernible. Pushing that aside, I moved towards another desk and had a look around. More bodies lay dead on the floor, and I decided to look for that radio. I bent down to one of them and moved his body to look up at me. The soldier suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the chest and face. <laughs> Just then, I heard a cough and aimed my weapon at the source of the sudden noise. It was one of their commandos that was still alive. I had the thought of just opening fire, but I wanted to try and get some answers. His head was slumped forward, leaning against a crate, and I could see his ribcage was poking out through the torn body armor. He must have been in a great deal of pain. I used this to my advantage and approached him. There wasn't a helmet on him, but the hairline was oddly familiar. Right as he looked up at me, I knew it was Callaway, one of the guys that had me sign the NDA. He sputtered and blood flew from his mouth. Trying to say something to me and I remained motionless, transfixed on this horrifying situation. His right arm was twitching, and he attempted to reach for what I assumed was his wound. His arm began moving faster, and just as I realized he was reaching for something else, I snapped back and a muffled pop to my right rang out. Calloway's head caved in. The pistol he went for dropped from his grip and landed to the side. I shouted out and got down on my knee, almost falling on my ass, aiming the rifle around, and found out there was another survivor. One of our guys had a silenced pistol aimed at Callaway and saved my life. He must have noticed my security guard patch on my winter coat and made the judgment call that I wasn't a threat. I quickly registered the situation and called out to Jeff, rushing over to the soldier while aiming around to see if anyone else noticed almost in tears at this point. I finally got to him and studied the man in my arms, noticing his rank. He was the captain for this platoon. Jeff quickly made it over to the soldier, and the soldier was reaching for his face mask. Jeff then took off the soldier's helmet and face mask for him with ease. There was blood pooling out of his mouth, and he also had severe wounds to the abdomen. 
Some of the blood got onto my coat and hands, but I didn't care. I needed to hear this man's last words now, or it would be too late. He put his life on the line for this. Can you speak? I asked, and he was still coughing up blood quietly. He did not speak or move at first. He just looked at me with an expression one would only have on the verge of death. And then with a slow and deliberate motion, he opened his front pouch and felt around for something. I saw his eyes close, and he smiled through the pain. He then frowned and pulled out a small USB port and offered it to me, still coughing. When he did this, my insides flipped, and I instantly asked, What is this? and took it from his hand. The captain looked up at the ceiling while choking on blood and only said, Every thing. As his eyes rolled, his body went still, and he took his last breath right there in my arms. There was nothing else to do but gently lay him back to the ground and let the fallen captain rest in peace now. After a passing moment of silence, taking another look at the bodies around me, I took a look at the USB port in my hand. Jeff, cover me, okay? I know this is reckless, but I need to know what this contains now. I don't think I can wait, I told him. And Jeff, as usual, kept quiet and nodded, giving me his stern look again. I made it to a computer and popped it in with Jeff following. He raised the weapon to study the area periodically, but we couldn't keep our eyes away from the screen. There was a report with some attached files. Once the file transfer was complete, I read it all in one go, as quickly as I possibly could. To sum it up, this attack and gathering of information on a certain terrorist organization was called Operation Winter Eyes and anyone available on call was sent to wipe out the force from a group called TNDA that was found on U.S. soil, otherwise known as the New Dawn Administration. All of what I am about to share is obviously not meant for civilians to hear about, but all things considered, I don't really give a fuck right now. Throughout reading this, I found out that not only are secrets and advanced technology being kept from the public, but ranks within NASA had been infiltrated by one of these members, and gain information about a planet's moon that's never been documented before, according to the report. Which planet was crossed out? That doesn't surprise me. Apparently, this moon had proof of living organisms residing there. Thermal readings and multiple satellite videos displayed these life forms fully functioning, and people were beyond ecstatic. A team was, of course, sent out into the outer edge of the planet's rim. The ship sent a team of 14 people, and they came back. But something terrible happened to some of those astronauts, and it was seemingly because of this TNDA group. Records indicate that someone from inside the spacecraft fired off some kind of relay signal and disrupted the life forms from moving and quite possibly sustaining their habitat. These creatures were able to somehow collectively reach the NASA spacecraft from the moon and cause damage to the hull. Records indicate the impact on the damage report showed no signs of any cause for losing control out there in space. However, the report stated that several of these life forms housed themselves inside the bodies of some of the astronauts sent out there, and throughout this were able to pilot their way back to Earth and landed somewhere in the North Atlantic. 
The report indicated that these parasitic anomalies were only capable of feeding, reproducing, and if housed inside another biological life form for a long enough period of time, can essentially rewire the human genome down to the very last cell within the unfortunate victim's body. They classified the size of the things to be about six to seven feet long, and were considered as being somewhat similar to Tainocilium, or pork tapeworm. Scientists, at the time of containing the initial outbreak, were able to use cutting-edge technology to halt the organisms from causing any more harm, and only when the military came back with the NASA spacecraft did researchers find out that this parasite was able to perfectly take over and even mimic the host it is able to feed on or infect with its offspring, which are microscopic, larva-like organisms that infect your organs from the inside, and eventually taking over by reaching the brain. The organs and limbs are digested and somehow reanimated. Using this substance, the larva collectively secrete that is similar to mucus, and the main parasite body can trigger commands from within, using its own cellular network like a hive mind. It can then even intake oxygen like any other human being after a full assimilation, steadily growing larger and larger from within as the feeding continues. It's said that mutations occur after that point. How large they can grow isn't documented, but there was a patient zero that was supposed to help them determine that in humans. The scientists were, at one point, able to test these things on animals like dogs, monkeys, and even large reptiles with results that would make your stomach churn. What was supposed to be a simple gather and collect data mission in space turned out to be something unimaginable. And the big guy we just saw toss a soldier like it was yesterday's trash? Patient Zero. Patient Zero had no record of any identity, at least not on this report. Just that he was an astronaut sent to that planet and the name was blocked out. He was actually being hauled to a top-secret government prison when TNDA intercepted the smaller military convoy and successfully took the shackled brute to the steel mill, tricking Sam into thinking this was official business somehow. The military tried to track down the group but were unsuccessful. TNDA decided that this was a golden opportunity and began experiments on the subject immediately here, acquiring all the necessary fake documents to make everything seem legitimate. There was a side note typed out in this section that read, Possible aid from double agent, identity unknown. The file also indicated that any other abilities of this organism, while inside a biological life form, were yet to be determined, but thoroughly studied. After more research, they concluded that certain vibrations, frequencies, and sound waves were able to control the organism from within its host, putting it in some sort of stasis. They collected that data from the audio logs of the mission, determining the sound waves on that planet caused them to, in unison, vibrate on the planet's surface and are contained within the atmosphere that way. But the relay signal caused that piercing frequency to occur as they approached the unknown planet before the attack. Whoever figured that out had to be a damn genius. That would explain the loudspeakers here, and it was recorded that the designated frequency would cause an amount of discomfort in human beings. Yet the sound is somehow barely audible. It must have been amplified underground. When introduced to water or certain temperatures, this thing adapts to the environment without fail, as the cellular structure of these parasitic entities are not fully known to planet Earth. If housed and fed inside the invaded biological organism long enough, the human who fell victim to the parasite 
would appear the same as the person they were before, but only now all human emotion and empathy have been devoured. You would see a shell of the former person they once were. The report also claims that the limbs are detached or removed. The cellular function within the reanimated body would cause a mutation to occur. That was the only information I could gather from this report on Patient Zero and these things they found. Anything else is either yet to be documented or the government and TNDA no more. However now, since some assholes in a fucked the fuck up doomsday cult disturbed the natural order in the solar system, we now know that these things made contact with humans and can remain housed comfortably inside a life form and like a twisted puppeteer sent from outer space. TNDA had also done their own studies, but I couldn't find any more information. How to exterminate these things has yet to be documented. With all of this in mind, there was another attached file that explained how one of the underground hives and facilities under direct command of the United States government had, in fact, been compromised at one point as well, thus turning over a plethora of information, as well as access to a certain satellite unit's mainframe. The sole perpetrator had posed as a researcher and escaped with all of this classified intel. They made the connection that, since that top member gained access to certain satellites, they assumed he or she used some kind of jammer to block them from tracking their location after the capture of Patient Zero and fooling the military. The man, or woman, in question is known to be a figurehead in this terrorist group, and their identity has yet to be verified. The only alias they've uncovered is a single name of Goldstein, and from what the military gathers, plans on using diseases and, and even create bioweapons to infiltrate certain military compounds and trigger an apocalyptic event to capitalize on. Surprisingly, over the years this group gained quite the following in the underground world of this country. Ex-Secret Service agents and even grunts for the Marines were blacklisted, and it stated that cults were being formed with agents spreading the influence all over the planet. All targets and enemies of the state. The report had also mentioned a steel mill owner getting killed after speaking to a scientist over a radio transmission, informing the scientists of roof access. Sam is now dead because he tried to tell someone about TNDA. Ray really had overheard one of those assholes telling Sam about the dig and probably more we didn't know about. Ray. That lucky bastard. Wait until he gets a load of this, I thought to myself. Well, what a merry fucking Christmas this turned out to be. After reading through all of this, Jeff and I stood for a long moment, staring at the computer screen, displaying images of people that had no idea who were being photographed. Men in suits getting into luxurious vehicles with a security detail, what looked to be a team of researchers, and these monstrous experiments the military conducted on animals, and I could clearly see what they did to Patient Zero. They sliced him apart and reattached him time and time again to get their data. Jeff and I decided to just get the hell out of Dodge and we found Sam's old company truck nearby with the keys still in his office. Thank God there was still enough gas in there to just get us onto the main road and out of there. We got in with me driving and took off down the road and past the burning helicopter. Once we made it onto the main road, there was a military Humvee on fire near a trail that snakes off by the main road as well. 
It was undoubtedly one of their checkpoints that got overrun in case the battle was in their favor and civilians came around. Knowing that this place was housed in the middle of nowhere and people were rarely seen around here, I had to wonder if people could even hear the explosions and gunfire, or even if the world was listening at all. Probably distracted by their phones and devices. If they had thermals watching us from above, they let us escape. Because I never got stopped, nor did I stop driving until we were far away from that nightmare. This made me wonder even more. Another thing that stuck out is when I took a glance in the rear view mirror, I almost stopped the vehicle. But before I even had the thought to even slow down, Jeff said something that snapped me back to staying alive. Keep driving. After he said this, I only nodded and sped up, because one of our soldiers was standing on the road watching us drive away from the steel mill, with his stomach entirely emptied. This was over a month ago. I haven't even watched the news or gone online and just assumed the attack was completely covered up as an accident or something. This is the first time since the ordeal that I've been online, and I haven't heard anything from Jeff or Ray. Jeff asked me to drop him off somewhere near his house after that, and I decided on moving from place to place. I doubted they would just leave me alone, so I decided on running and keeping that USB port from the soldier with me, for the time being at least. I'm being followed now. I know it. It was only a matter of time before I either slipped up or they were just able to find me. Unfortunately, like a paranoid moron, I slipped up by using that USB port and my laptop I quickly grabbed from home, along with a few important items. I just wanted to confirm again that, that what I was seeing wasn't some hallucination. However, it triggered something, a failsafe or whatever, in bold letters a message popped up. This device has been compromised. I just panicked, smashing the thing in my laptop to pieces right there in the hotel room and quickly darted out of there. I already paid for two nights, but it was time to move. I don't know who to trust. Maybe I should just let the military capture me. But I just panicked and destroyed the USB. Even if the military is trying to get to me, I don't know if I want that kind of involvement right now. They have already displayed the carnage and lengths they would go to to seemingly cover this up. Imagine what they might do to me. I'm not only paranoid, but terrified beyond words, and have considered just taking my own life after I post this story. <sighs> Maybe the military will help, after all. I don't really know if I want to take any chances. Normally I wouldn't take such drastic measures, but I'm just a nobody anyway. And, and whatever they have in store for me just might be worse. Before I sign off, I said that I was being followed, sure, but the TNDA or the military isn't the only force I am worried about. That thing escaped from the steel mill, and there was another topic that went over my head throughout everything I had taken in. These things are capable of infecting a host and the soldier that was being gripped by Patient Zero had to have been completely taken over by now. 
I keep seeing these people randomly appear before me throughout my time of running. They would be standing somewhere, eerily watching me from a distance. It would be a different person every time. I would notice them, and they wouldn't move a muscle. They would just remain still with their eyes fixed on me no matter where I would go. I would walk through a crowd of people, drive somewhere, take a risk and grab a bite or a drink somewhere, and boom, they would be there. Faces fixed in a blank expression, focused on me, and only me. Somewhere, either outside a window or even close by, being mere feet away. If these things somehow perfectly blend in with society, then we need to know. I can't imagine you would want to be kept in the dark about something like this. And if TNDA somehow captures this monstrosity again, then who knows what might happen. It's late in the morning, and I am currently held up in some shitty hotel room yet again. Paying cash and not using my card or real name for anyone to track. I've taken to drinking again, and eat sleeping pills like candy every night to attempt at blocking out my night terrors. Wow, I didn't even realize how long this had gotten. Even so, when you go through something traumatic, reliving the experience can become easy. I honestly don't know where else to go. And whoever actually takes the time and hears this. Thank you. And know this. Something beyond our wildest imaginations exists out there, and there's nothing we can do about it. Let this be a warning to those who wonder about the secrets of the world. Lock your doors. Give your loved ones a hug and a kiss. And remember, that danger could be closer to home than we may think. Hopefully, someone who can actually help does something. The world may very well depend on it. I hope you enjoyed I Was a Security Guard for a Steel Mill, as written by Creepy Face and voiced by Creepy Face, Jeff Sturdivant, Nick Goroff, Kyle Stroud, Eric Peabody, and myself, Steve Taylor. Creatures of the Night know this name well because they either respect or fear him. That name is Creepy Face. While he isn't here at Chilling Tales or on his YouTube channel, he reads bedtime stories to whispers in the void, and not only is he a dweller in the dark, but anything terrifying to him is considered comfort. Legends say that he has a voice capable of haunting the minds of vengeful spirits, and the last thing before they are trapped inside an endless nightmare is a creepy face. Will you enter the terror? Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Scare in a Box and is performed by Justin Reynolds, Otis Jiry, and Melissa Medina. In it, we meet a man in a very perilous position with a very important company using technology that may very likely not only be our future, but even already exist. Who can say, right? Now, without further ado, I present to you Hikers of the Pocket Jungle. I refilled my coffee cup from the office's new state-of-the-art coffee maker and headed back to my workplace. It's the middle of my shift and therefore time for a caffeine recharge. I sit in front of the monitor and look at the data it presents to me. Everything is in order. 
The tubes move perfectly and the various systems they have work correctly. The force through which they move is in normal condition. I push one of the buttons and the data slides aside, showing me the force outside the building, which everyone in my sector monitors all day every day. The forest to the naked eye is normal. It seems a simple recreation of the natural and pristine places of yesteryear, when technology hadn't invaded everything and nature hadn't decayed. It's a simple imitation, of course. This place is not natural. Not really. The trees had been planted in a special way. The environment is meticulously controlled. The species that inhabit have been specifically selected to be there and give the best experience to each client with enough money to buy a ride. The Sensory Woods is not a normal ride though. Many companies offer walks to the artificial forests. Some do them by boat and some even with a flight mechanism. We don't do any of that. We go further. The forest is specifically designed to be the perfect sensory experience. The trees in each of the places are pierced by special tubes through which the brains of our clients are transported. Yes, the brains. Clients pay a fortune to have their brains removed from their bodies and placed in sensory tubes where they are connected to artificial sensory organs. Eyes and noses specially created to provide the best experience of their lives. Or so they say. Personally, I have never tried it. I find the idea of my brain being transported through the tubes uh, a bit creepy. The point is that artificial eyes give customers a privileged view of the species that inhabit the forest. The entire spectrum of colors that human eyes are capable of seeing. And some say even more than we can see. The noses complete the experience, causing customers to be surrounded by the most inexplicable fragrances in the universe. Everything you can imagine in one place. While the brains take the ride, the client's bodies are kept in life support chambers specially designed to keep them alive. As soon as the trip is over, the brains return to their bodies without any side effects, just with the memories of what happened in the forest. The result is the best sensory experience in the world. And my job is to monitor the tubes through which the brains move. They are specially prepared to keep them alive and safe. They have the right nutrients, plus the right temperature, acidity, and radiation. Nothing is left to chance, and all data is displayed on my monitor. It's a simple job, if I don't think about the true implications of it. I'm helping people take their brains off and move them to and through places they shouldn't move them. But it's simple, because nothing ever happens. Everything is so perfectly calibrated that I have never seen even a slight deviation from normal and they pay me well. I can't ask for much more. I take a long sip of the coffee. It's at the perfect temperature. The new coffee maker is so automatic that it doesn't even need time to heat the water. I have no idea how it works, but it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. I guess the company wants even its employees to have a good sensory experience. I yawn a little. I look at the clock. There are about three hours until my shift ends. I look at the tube data again, but everything is fine. So I settle back into my chair and enjoy my coffee. A sound like an explosion makes me jump out of my seat. I inadvertently knock over my coffee cup and the liquid ends up spilling all over the floor. My ears start to ring and I put my hands over my ears to cover them, but the sound continues. I look everywhere. My companions are as bewildered as I am. I watch the monitors. My heart begins to race. The graphics indicate that the tubes have stopped transporting. Something has gone wrong. Very wrong. System's down! Someone yells. I look everywhere, searching for a more precise explanation. Life support systems are down. Says one of my colleagues. Her voice sounds shaky. What do you mean? I ask. Deactivated. She repeats. 
They stopped working. They, they, they turned off. She looks at me. There is panic in her eyes. I don't blame her. Without the maintenance systems, the bodies of the people who are traveling will begin to decay. To rot. To die. How are the tubes? Asks my department manager. He's just as scared as everyone else. They've stopped moving, I reply. But the brain should be intact. They're not damaged. Just detained. I hasten to add. Should? He asked me. Obviously, my attempt to calm him down hasn't worked. I am... I, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. The monitors don't tell me the status of the tubes. Not these, at least. I would have to review the other data to find out. I can't tell the structural state of the tubes from here. I can go check the other monitors. I can't keep talking. An explosion. This time, I know it's an explosion. Because I can feel the shockwave and see the fire... Whips through the facility. The room shakes. And we all fall to the floor. What we felt before must have been another explosion, but smaller. I hide under the table. My hands over my ears. The shaking stops. But there is a smell of burning. My ears are ringing even louder than before. And when I open my eyes, I can see that the room has been filled with some pretty thick white smoke. I crawl from under the table and stand up, with some difficulty helping myself from the chair that is now lying on the floor. I look everywhere. My colleagues are also recovering. All the monitors are off and the only thing that can be seen are the emergency lights. If the life support systems weren't compromised before, now they must be. I don't even want to think how. Shattered. Disabled. What will happen to the bodies? My co-workers are covered in dust. And I guess that's my condition too. They all seem just as surprised and disoriented as I am. I don't understand what's going on. And we won't be able to find out from here. All systems are down. No power. Someone yells. I see my boss run out of the room. The rest of us look at each other and without saying anything decide to follow him. It's useless to stay here after all. The corridors are in a terrifying gloom. I had never seen him this way, not even on night shifts. The power to the whole place must have been turned off. With only the emergency lights as a guide, we head towards the sector where the bodies of customers are kept. The only thing that is visible is a small green light on the ceiling. The rest of the room is dark and the tanks where the bodies are kept are not visible. We also can't see the operators who should be working there. My boss is glued to the window, with the greenest reflection illuminating his features. He seems terrified. They're gonna die. He mutters. Everything's destroyed. Isn't there something we can do? I ask. He looks at me. Everything is quiet now. The ringing in my ears is over. So much silence is terrifying. Pray that the brains are safe. He tells me. I bite my lower lip. We can't tell what state the brains are in from here. I look everywhere. My colleagues look at each other. They look at me. At the boss. At the room with the bodies. It seems that there is only one possible solution. <sighs> we have to go outside and check on the tubes, I say. The boss looks at me for a moment, then sighs. Yes, it's the only alternative. What good will it do? Asks one of my colleagues. If they're okay, we don't know how long they'll last. If they are dead, we can do nothing to fix it. I'm sure someone's already on the way, says the boss. Someone must have reported the explosions, I'm sure. He pauses. He actually doesn't seem sure at all. We are not the only ones who work here. Maintenance should already be working on a fix. Our job is to control the tubes. Keep the brains safe. Let's do our job. 
we all end up nodding our heads and following him. We continue along the corridor to the transition zone between the premises and the forest. The room itself is just as dark as the rest of the building, but we manage to find the necessary protective suits to enter the forest. As soon as I put on the suit, a small screen activates on my left arm. It informs me of my vital signs and the general conditions of the environment. We go outside and the panorama seems even worse than inside the building. Nothing can be seen. The smoke is so thick that I can barely distinguish my own body. I know my coworkers are by my side because I hear their footsteps. The footsteps against the undergrowth, crushing the leaves and breaking the small pieces of bark that have begun to fall. Flashlights can't get through the thick smoke, so they're of little help. I look at the little screen I have on my suit which shows me where we are. The tubes are supposed to be a few meters away. They have to be here. But we can't see them. I cannot see anything. The screen on my wrist tells me that my heart is racing. Of course it is, you silly machine. This situation is hopeless. The whole facility is in danger. The people in here are about to die. And me? Losing my job will be the least of my problems if those brains die. I stop short. That thought paralyzes me. But what paralyzes me the most is the fact that the texture of the soil has changed. I just stepped on something. Something soft. Delicate. Something that shouldn't be in the ground. I look down. I shine the flashlight right at my feet. And there it is. My worst nightmare. How many years in prison will I get for murdering someone? By stepping on their brain. I hope you enjoyed Hikers of the Pocket Jungle as written by Scare in a Box and performed by Justin Reynolds, Otis Jiry, and Melissa Medina. Justin Reynolds has an intense adoration for music. He loves all the artistic and creative endeavors of life from the beautiful to the ugly. As a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot -S com. Otis Jiry, a former sports commentator on CHQR in Vancouver, is now a veteran broadcaster, voice actor, and narrator with more than 15 years of experience in the industry and a reputation for providing his signature style of smooth, personable storytelling on demand. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has a show on Sunday nights that features two stories on the standard edition, as well as two more which can be accessed through the patrons area. On that note, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Horror Hill, airing Thursdays for your more hardcore, more brutal offerings. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Friday, featuring some southern down-home humor. And Fear from the Heartland airs Wednesdays. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Dreams. <laughs>
Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 